Okay, excited to have you. Um, so Jacob is a professor at MIT and a former postdoc at Berkeley. So I think it's a good fit. And uh, I, without further delay, I'll let you take it away. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, this is like cool reading group. Uh, very happy to be able to present here. Um, and you know what I'm going to be talking about today, I guess, is not exactly like multi-agent reinforcement learning, but uh, but broadly on the theme of uh, communication and learning, um, and specifically thinking about how we can use um, communication and use specifically language as a tool for training machine learning models, uh, not just for natural language processing applications, but sort of across uh, application areas. Um, and I want to start with uh, a very big question, right, which is the question of how people learn. Um, one of the sort of distinguishing features of human cognition is the ease with which we are able to learn new skills and new concepts. Um, and we do this in a bunch of different ways. So when we're lying in the crib, right, before we even really have any ability to control our environments, uh, we learn a lot still just by sort of observing what we see and trying to predict what's going to happen next or try to compress what we've seen before. Um, once we gain the ability to act, we learn a huge amount uh, from interaction, from, from exploration, from trial and error. Uh, once we learn things about our social environment, uh, we learn also via explicit labeling and explicit demonstration from our teachers. Um, and finally, once we have acquired language, uh, we learn a lot from, as humans, from language. And, and so it's the last of these things that we're really going to be focusing on today. Um, you know, the set of things that we learn about the world from language is really pretty enormous, right? There's sort of factual knowledge, what things are true, what things are, you know, the case, how the world works. Uh, we learn procedures, ways of doing things, uh, you know, how to cook, how to tie your shoes, whatever else. Um, we even learn information uh, in the form of language that extends our knowledge of language arts our, our itself, right, from sort of dictionaries and encyclopedias and things like that. Um, most of us learned the things that, you know, sort of got us into this seminar today by doing things like listening to lectures and reading books and talking to colleagues. Um, and, you know, and so this is clearly like an important part of the story for how people learn. Um, there's obviously a lot that you have to do to get to the point uh, where we can learn from language and our ability to, to learn language relies very heavily on all these other kinds of learning uh, that we were looking at on the previous slide. But once we have language, that's really the tool that we use for getting these more complicated skills. Um, and in fact, it's the ability to learn from language that in some sense is like one of the fundamental things that separates humans from all of the other learning systems that nature has produced. Um, and, you know, it's probably worth noting that it also separates us from all of the learning systems that humans have produced. Right, that all of the other sort of categories that we were of learning that we were looking at on the previous slide are you know, sort of overarching topics in machine learning research that have their own textbooks and their own conferences uh, and so on, except for this last category of learning from language. Um, and so what I'm going to be talking about today are a couple of like baby first steps towards making uh, language a first class tool for training intelligence systems, just like all of these other kinds of learning. Um, so first off, why has it taken us as long as it has to get to this point? Um, and one possible reason for this, like we were saying before, is that there's a bunch of other skills that you need in order to even begin to learn, uh, learn enough language to use it to learn other things. Um, and of these, I want to highlight two. Uh, the first, of course, is the ability to understand language itself, right? What words mean, how words fit together. Uh, if we're going to use language to learn other things, we first like somehow need the ability to learn language itself. Um, and the second is the ability to learn representations and especially sort of multimodal representations of concepts that integrate information uh, from vision uh, for, you know, sort of perception more generically, uh, from control, uh, from language. Uh, and so if we're going to use language to potentially supervise other machine learning tasks, we need also to figure out how language actually grounds out in the other domains that we're trying to model. Um, and I'd argue that it's really just in the last couple of years that the tools for doing both of these things have actually become mature enough to sort of make this a viable research program. Um, but we now have, on the one hand, general purpose tools for predicting structured representations of language, uh, you know, things like parse trees and logical forms that really give us access to underlying linguistic structure, uh, and also, you know, sort of big pre-trained models like, like BERT and GPT uh, that expose these kinds of structured representations of language internally. Um, 
and that we also have general purpose learning tools for building kind of shared embedding spaces in which representations of sentences and representations of images and control policies uh, can all kind of live together. Um, and, you know, sure enough, building on these things, we've started to see some initial approaches to natural language supervision uh, in specific problem domains, right? So, you know, we've all seen CLIP, right, using uh, captioned images as a form of natural language supervision for learning problems generically. Uh, there's been some cool work in NLP from like Tom Mitchell's group uh, on using uh, sort of semantic parsers to build logical representations of concepts that you can use to train classifiers in other domains. Um, and so in some sense, the, the project today is going to be taking this foundation and scaling it up, uh, not just to classification problems, but all of the other things that we want to do with the learning toolkit. Uh, one of these is learning models that don't just make one-off decisions, but that can actually interact with the world. They can reason about their future actions and the consequences of those actions. Um, and so the first thing that I'm going to talk about today uh, is using language to learn reusable skills uh, for planning and acting. Um, and, you know, in addition to these kinds of decision-making problems, another sort of core problem in artificial intelligence um, is the following, given sort of noisy observations of the world, can we actually figure out the rules governing the process that generated those observations, uh, right, which is what we do, uh, at least in NLP, right, when we do things like clustering documents, inferring grammars, building question answering systems, uh, and this shows up you know, this kind of like structured structured learning of representations, learning of generative models and causal models uh, shows up in all kinds of other machine learning applications as well. Uh, and today we're going to look at it through the lens of program induction uh, and sort of using language to build procedures that can infer programs given just inputs and outputs. Um, and last, there's probably not going to be time to talk about this, but we have some very recent work uh, on using language as a tool for uh, explaining decisions in deep networks as a sort of first step towards learners that can learn interactively. Uh, and, and maybe we can talk about this at the very end. Cool. Um, but let's just jump into this, uh, starting with the problem of using language to help us learn uh, skills and policies for interacting in the environment. Uh, and the main student who did this work is Pratisha Sharma, uh, also a collaboration with, with Antonio Terralba at MIT. So, you know, I flashed at the beginning of the talk a cookbook, and you can think of cooking as a kind of canonical example of a family of skills that we learn, uh, at least in part from natural language guidance. It's like very hard to even go onto YouTube uh, and find somebody demonstrating some sort of cooking skill while not simultaneously narrating what it is that they're trying to demonstrate. Um, and if we want to do complicated things uh, and sort of build automated systems that can do complicated things like cooking, uh, we need to start with even simpler manipulation tasks that might need to happen in household environments. You know, things like finding our way around, uh, picking up objects, uh, interacting with really simple appliances and containers. Um, and so what we're looking at on the slide right now is an example from the Alfred environment, which you may have seen before. Um, Alfred is a sort of household simulation environment designed to do exactly that, uh, containing tasks that look like put a, bowl, a clean bowl of water on the kitchen island, where you can see this agent is sort of navigating around in this environment, finding a bowl, it's going to clean the bowl in the sink. Uh, and if we played this out to the end, it would eventually uh, set it back down on the kitchen counter. Um, and even a really simple task, or a sort of superficially simple task, Right, like put a clean bowl of water on the kitchen island, or you know something even simpler, like put the knife in the drawer. Um, have a lot of moving parts. On one hand, they require us to you know sort of at the low level do things like recognize objects uh, and plan paths between visible locations in an environment, um, and at the high level to reason about the long-term consequences of those low-level actions. You know, in fact, even a task as innocuous as, you know, cause the knife to be located in the drawer involves a bunch of high level steps like finding the knife and grasping it and finding the drawer and opening it and setting the knife down and closing the drawer. And, you know, more complicated tasks like this one involve even more steps. And this is still a real challenge for modern machine learning tools. Um, if we don't actually try to model any of this kind of hierarchical structure, um, and we just go out and get, you know, 10,000 demonstrations of people accomplishing tasks in these Alfred environments. And we train some kind of deep network policy that's going to map directly from high level goals uh, and observations to low level actions. Um, 
this doesn't work at all. And we complete really only a very small fraction of these tasks. Um, so we probably need to do something to model this intermediate structure. Uh, and what might that look like? One thing that it might look like is, is something like this, uh, that we're actually going to build two models. We'll build one model that decomposes abstract goals, like get the knife into the drawer, into sequences of high-level sub-goals or high-level subtasks. Uh, and then we'll build a second model that knows how to translate each of those high-level subtasks into a sequence of low-level actions, right? So think about sort of planning at the high level, uh, planning over tasks if you come from a sort of task and motion planning tradition, uh, and then translating those high-level objectives into low-level actions. Um, there is, in fact, a huge literature on uh, agent architectures that work this way, right, going back to the earliest days of machine learning. But for the most part, they require you to either formalize your domain symbolically and hand engineer some kind of high-level decision-making mechanism or planning mechanism, um, or to pre-commit to some sort of fixed inventory of skills, and then go out and collect a bunch of specialized demonstrations or rewards uh, you know, that allow you to implement a sort of special purpose controller for each of those skills that you committed to ahead of time. Uh, there are also totally unsupervised methods here, uh, but they tend not to do what we want. So, you know, we have this sort of high level intuition that uh, our life would be a lot easier if we could build hierarchical policies like this. Um, but actually building hierarchical policies in practice, even with decades of research, uh, still seems to be pretty hard. Um, we have a question in the chat if you're willing to yeah. take it. Um, another thing that matters for this kind of no planning perception to action mapping from IL would be visual representation learning. Given that we have an ideal visual encoder, how necessary would planning be then? Yeah, so I think, you know, at least empirically, I should double check that literally this 20% number, 27% number comes from a model with a big pre-trained encoder, but, you know, like narrowly within Alfred is one piece of evidence. This is a standard thing that people do, right? That you pre-train on ImageNet or with, you know, one of these fancy unsupervised vision and language schemes. Uh, and that only gets you so far. Or even you assume access to uh, like really relatively structured representations of uh, the visual scene that you know are adequate in these household environments where you like run a semantic segmenter or an object detector or something. Um, and in practice, you know, for these kinds of problems, this is still hard. So yeah, visual representation learning is super hard, but I think it's still the case that even if you throw modern visual representation, like, you know, vision pre-training or vision and language pre-training at these kinds of tasks, modeling sequences of actions is still quite difficult. Um, good. So given that modeling sequences of actions is still quite difficult, uh, how might language help us with this problem? Um, and so what we're going to look at now is a way of using language uh, as a sort of different tool for training these kinds of hierarchical models that gives us control over the high level skills that are learned without actually requiring us to pre-commit to sort of specific skills or to formal domain representations. Um, so in particular, uh, to sort of preview what we're going to do here, uh, we're going to build a model that works in the following way. We're going to start with a data set of demonstrations, right, of these kinds of high-level goals paired with low-level sequences of observations and actions. And rather than trying to sort of predefine any fixed skill set or domain representation, uh, we'll just ask people to annotate some of these demonstrations with instructions. Uh, in, in the case of this Alfred environment that we looked at before, these instructions are actually already part of the data set, uh, which is quite convenient. Um, but, you know, start with a data set of demonstrations and just get people to basically narrate what it is that they see. So a couple important points here. First, we're using freeform language, right? No guarantee of consistency in how a given skill or task or sub goal uh, gets selected or described across tasks or even within tasks. Uh, second, we're going to assume that we have no information about the correspondence uh, between these instruction sequences and uh, the individual, or yeah, between these instructions and the individual actions they describe. We're just going to show somebody a video and ask them to sort of narrate the high level steps that they see. Um, and most importantly, we're going to assume that we have this language only at training time. So we're not trying to do instruction following at the end of the day. We still want to build agents that get only these kinds of high level goals at input as input. Uh, and produce the right low-level actions as output, uh, but we're going to use a little bit of training uh, of language at training time to do so. 
Um, and finally, and maybe most importantly, uh, even though these individual annotations uh, are relatively easy to collect, right? Don't require special sort of simulation hardware uh, or, or skilled annotators or anything like that. Uh, getting a lot of them might still be expensive. So the last thing that we're going to assume about natural language supervision uh, is that we don't actually have very much of it. So in the experiments we're going to look at in a minute, we're going to assume that we only actually have this kind of language for like five or ten percent of demonstrations, and that for the most of the data, right, all we actually have are goals observations and actions. Okay, so here's a high level problem formulation. We have an environment, we have goals, we have demonstrations, and at training time only, uh, we have access to a few instructions. And we want to use these instructions to build some kind of agent that can get from goals to actions on its own. So how might we go about using this data? Um, and here's a picture of the policy that we're going to try to train. This policy should look familiar, right? Uh, that it is going to map from high-level goals to sequences of high-level actions, uh, and then from sequences of high-level actions to sequences of low-level actions. Uh, but these high-level actions, rather than being sort of predefined skills or predefined sub-goals, are now just natural language descriptions of abstract behaviors that an agent might perform. Um, and so, you know, we're going to generate a sort of natural language description of a plan conditioned on our goal and then generate actions in the environment conditioned on these, this natural language plan. Uh, so how might we go about training such an agent given the data that we have? Uh, remember that our training data looks like this, right? That we don't have natural language annotations for most of our demonstrations. When we do, we don't actually know how this language lines up uh, with low level actions that our agent is going to take. Uh, in other words, we have something that looks like a latent variable problem. On our annotated demonstrations, the correspondence between plans and actions is latent. And on unannotated demonstrations, on most of our training data, these high-level plans are themselves latent variables. Uh, and so we can solve this you know, in the way that we would solve basically any probabilistic latent variable problem. Uh, and in particular, we're going to describe a, a, an alternating maximization algorithm that looks a little bit like this. We're going to make an initial guess at what the alignments might look like on our labeled demonstrations uh, and you know, an initial guess both at the alignments uh, and the natural language descriptions on our unannotated demonstrations. Um, and then we'll alternate between refining the alignments, uh, refining the descriptions uh, of each of these aligned segments on the unannotated demonstrations, uh, and then finding better parameters, both for the policies that translate goals into plans and the policy that translates plans into actions. So, so to quick be, question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, and this might be something that like becomes clearer as you talk more. Um, so there was this paper out of Google a while ago that was like, language conditioned imitation learning on unstructured data that seems to be doing something kind of similar and i was just curious if this is like something in your mental model of like this is something different than what you're doing i i read it a while ago so i don't, I don't myself remember all of the specific details of what they did but it was just sort of pinging in my brain as like kind of similar to the work you're doing and i was just curious if you had a sense of yeah that, i of guess i don't know exactly what uh paper you're thinking of i mean there's certainly like a large literature on mapping from uh, strings to instructions or from strings mm -hmm. to things like cost functions that you then optimize. Um, and, you know, we're sort of using all of that literature to like build this actual model. I think the main distinction, you know, again, not knowing exactly what's going on in this other, other paper, the main distinction here uh, is that we have sort of demonstrations and the we think there's some abstract layer of high level structure, but that that is latent. Okay. Yeah, but I, we can try to dig up the paper and I will probably have something smarter to say about it uh, if, if, if we look at it then. Um, cool, so to talk briefly about how uh, this actually works in a little bit more detail, right? Here's all the variables that we actually care about drawn as something like a graphical model uh, and we can give these things all names. Um, and drawn in this way, right? The two sort of downward facing arrows on this picture correspond to the components of this hierarchical policy. Uh, that we have first a planning sub policy that's going to generate uh, high level sub goals uh, from top level objectives, uh, and then an acting sub policy that's going to generate actions from these plan components. Uh, so, something like this. 
Um, and to train this policy, we then basically need to do inference over, uh, sorry, the parameters of, uh, of these two policies and these latent variables, the sort of dashed boxes on the slide. Uh, and we're going to do this again, sort of by just doing approximate map inference here, uh, alternating between finding hard assignments to subtasks, alignments, and parameters uh, to just maximize the complete likelihood of the demonstrations under this learned policy. Hi, Jacob. Uh, I interrupt you. There's a there's a question. Uh, yeah. If, if you have a second. So uh, Nick asks. Uh, he's curious how a design like this may deal with context in the future. For example, cooking an egg might differ depending on your position above sea level. Um, do you place all responsibility for resolving contextual differences on the low level policies or uh, at higher levels? Yeah, that's a great question. So for the model that I'm going to describe right now, um, all of that context dependence happens at the low level. Uh, and in fact, this the sort of policy that translates goals into like high level plan specifications uh, is going to be an open loop controller. It's not going to see these observations at all. Um, we experimented with a version of that that like could actually condition on observations in this Alfred environment in particular. Tasks are simple enough that you don't actually need that. Uh, I think it would be relatively easy to, um, you know, also have this uh, goal to, to plan specification policy condition on richer kinds of contextual information, like what's your current observation or how high above sea level are you or whatever. Um, you know, a deeper question that we'll get to at the end is how it can take advantage of, you know, kind of like rich sources of background knowledge or textual descriptions of the environment that you're operating in right now uh, to actually figure out these, these high level plans. But for the moment, for what I'm about to describe, we're doing kind of the dumbest possible thing where uh, to get these, uh, these intermediate natural language descriptions, it's just a sort of sequence to sequence model. Great, thanks. Um, good, right, and you know, and so the way that we're going to train this is just alternating between a bunch of uh, of maximization steps that look like this. Um, I will go through these pretty quickly, but happy to talk in more detail later if people are interested in the gory details. Um, to align actions to plans, having fixed the other variables. Uh, this basically looks like uh, sort of inference in a hidden semi-Markov model, or like. Uh, dynamic time warping, or um, uh, uh, what's the what do speech people call this? Um, CTC, um, but you know, basically, where you have these kind of index valued latent variables that just say for each observation, in this case, for each action, what was the high level task that generated it? Uh, and so, there's a nice dynamic program for solving this uh, uh, in this way. Um, for the labeling step, once we fixed alignments. Uh, now I have a sequence of, you know, sort of high level natural language strings, uh, some model of the correspondence between each of those and actions, and maybe some model of transitions between them as well. Uh, this looks like inference in a hidden Markov model, uh, but a sort of funny hidden Markov model with an infinite state space where the states of the HMM are actually like every possible natural language string. Uh, and so there's some fun stuff that you have to do with, uh, with amortized inference models to actually solve this labeling problem. But at a high level, that's what's going on. Uh, and then once we've fixed all of these other uh, parameters, uh, actually updating the two policies here just looks like ordinary gradient descent. Um, okay, so how well does this actually work? And I guess coming back to a question that somebody was asking before, uh, an important detail here, uh, how are we parameterizing these two policies? Uh, like we said before, the top one is just a sequence to sequence model that takes a sort of string value goal specification and maps it to a sequence of, uh, of plan specifications. Uh, and then this other model is also sort of a sequence to sequence model that conditions on a goal, conditions on a current observation of the environment. Uh, and, you know, in fact, just in a kind of Markov way generates the right next action. Um, good. Uh, so how well does this work? Uh, first off, here's an example of what it does uh, at training time. So on a training demonstration that was unannotated, uh, here is the segmentation of that demonstration and the labeling of that demonstration that we infer with this procedure. Um, and you can see that it quite nicely sort of slices this up into uh, coherent reusable pieces uh, and labels each of those pieces with a high level description of what's going on. Uh, you know, 
things like finding the butter knife, grabbing the knife that's on the counter, finding the tomato, and so on and so forth. And you can see that these descriptions actually, you know, sort of are sensitive to the observations uh, that even though you can't tell, you know, in this like second high level action here, the grabbing the knife, just from the sequence of actions, you can't tell that it's a knife that's being picked up, uh, but that gets revealed by, uh, by the observations and incorporated into the descriptions. Um, and maybe more importantly, uh, this actually works at test time. So here's an example of the model being deployed. Given a high level goal, place a wash pan on the counter. We generate the sequence of natural language strings, uh, subtasks, uh, and then have a sub policy that executes each of those in, act, uh, in sequence. Uh, and you'll see that it actually sort of does the right thing here. Cool. And, you know, we don't need to watch this to the end, but the important thing is that this model has sort of autonomously translated place a washed pan onto the counter, on the counter into this plan, and then successfully executed it. And so one way of thinking about what we've done here um, is use this natural language supervision to induce a library of reusable skills that this agent can deploy for interacting with the environment. Um, but in contrast to the way that we usually think about skill learning or hierarchical policy learning, uh, the skill set here is really open-ended, right? Uh, that anything that you can describe with a natural language string that looks sort of like a natural language string this agent has seen at training time, uh, you can give it and it can use on its own as a step towards accomplishing a high level goal. So, you know, we have a sort of set of discrete skills here, uh, but it's an infinite set of discrete skills with internal compositional structure. Um, and most importantly, uh, the relationship between goals and these high level skills is now really a relationship between strings and strings. Uh, and what that means is that for this high level model, we can read sorry, we can really hook into, you know, modern large scale pre-trained language models and use that kind of pre-training to reason about the relationship between goals and plans. Um, so uh, what's the set of results that I want to show you? Yeah, I guess, you know, just briefly first off in terms of how this performs numerically, um, if you have only, you know, if you do normal behavior cloning with basically the same policy architecture that we're using for the low level model, um, it, like we were saying before, on all of the data in this alpha data set, it does quite poorly. Um, and if you introduce this intermediate level of natural language structure, even if you only have natural language annotations for 10% of the data, uh, you like, you know, more than double the, the success rate over the baseline model, so much so that you can even compete with state of the art models. Uh, these are on the right hand side of the screen now that actually like condition on ground truth sequences of high level actions at test time rather than having to generate them for themselves. Um, and the most exciting, and so I guess one other important architectural detail that I haven't said yet uh, that turns out to really matter here uh, is the fact that um, this model that translates goals into these high level actions um, is implemented with a pre-trained T5 sequence to sequence model that, you know, before we fine tuned on it, tuned it on Alfred was trained on approximately the entire internet. And what's nice about this is that we can give it goals uh, that never occurred in the Alfred training set. So here's what happens if you save the high level model, uh, scrub some apples. Uh, it generates a sequence of sort of high level natural language strings consisting of find the apple, uh, pick up the apple in the trash can, a little weird, unclear why the apple's in the trash can, go to the sink, go to the sink put the apple in the sink, scrub it, and then set it down on the counter. Um, this model, when we were fine tuning it to sort of generate these kinds of instructions, never saw the verb scrub. But because this model was pre-trained, uh, it was able to take advantage of that pre-training to learn that scrubbing is sort of like washing. Scrubbing is something that you do in a sink using water. Um, and therefore, we can actually generalize successfully to, uh, to new high-level goals just by using uh, pre-training on language data. Um, Good. And, you know, I think one coming back to one of the questions that, that somebody had before about how we could, you know, more how, how sophisticated we're being about conditioning on context and how we might be able to do that more effectively. You know, I think this is really where you hook into that, right, that you could even imagine describing uh, in text like, hey, I'm two miles above sea level, like uh, I'm trying to cook some pasta. What should I do? Uh, and conditioning on the text. Um, 
in addition to your observations of the environment when figuring out what your high level sequence of actions should be. Now, in any data set of demonstrations that you're ever like plausibly going to be able to get annotated, you're not going to have demonstrations of people, you know, cooking, cooking mac and cheese two miles above sea level or, you know, being in a kitchen where actually there are no can openers available, but I have like a knife and a boot. What should I do? Uh, but those are the kinds of things that people talk about on the Internet and in books and things like that. Um, and where this kind of pre-training actually potentially gives us a mechanism uh, for taking sort of background information about the world that's encoded in language and translating it into real actions in the real world. Um, we have a technical question from Lee Dan. Yeah. Um, are the skill policies trained independently for each skill to imitate the demonstrations? If some skills are very similar, does it still train each from scratch? Yeah, no, so sorry. Uh, yeah, important question. There are exactly two policies here. One generates plans conditioned on goals. One generates low level actions conditioned on plans specified as natural language strings um, and uh, observations specified as uh, as images. And so like concretely what's going on under the hood is there's uh, um, it's like a sequence to sequence transformer model. You first encode the image so that it lives in the same embedding space as the token embeddings. And then you just concatenate all those things together and you generate uh, like discrete action descriptions as output. Thanks. OK. Um, cool. So to sort of summarize uh, this first section of the talk, um, we described how to train a hierarchical policy that reasons over sequences of high level skills parameterized by natural language strings. Um, and we showed that we could train these kinds of, you know, sort of like latent instruction or latent string models very efficiently uh, by just like inferring these latent descriptions of, of plan structures uh, on data sets of demonstrations. Uh, and that we could do this sort of inference of, of, uh, of plans jointly with parameters of the model that generates those and interprets those plans itself. Um, and we saw that this actually works uh, and that it produces models that are competitive uh, with models that have very, very strong supervision uh, and that it generalizes in non-trivial ways, uh, even sometimes out of, like totally out of distribution. Cool. So the second question that I wanted to ask, uh, and I'll try to leave a little bit of time for questions at the end too, um, is whether we can take this machinery uh, and apply it to other problems, uh, and in particular problems where we really care about, excuse me, about the values of these latent variables themselves rather than the final model predictions. Uh, and the sort of main student on this work was uh, Kathy Wong uh, in collaboration with Josh Tenenbaum and Kevin Ellis. Okay, so, uh, you know, we said our goal is to, to think about problems where we care about inferring latent variables. And a sort of canonical problem here, canonical latent variable problem is uh, inductive program synthesis. So rather than trying to get from goals to actions, we're going to try to start with some kind of specification, like an image that we want to figure out how to draw, or like a set of test cases for a computer program, and to generate uh, from those specifications, you know, a program that draws the image or a program that passes the tests. Um, these kinds of problems come up all the time, you know, in sort of like real world text editing applications, in inverse graphics applications of a kind that computer vision people care a lot about. Um, and, you know, in some sense, as before, uh, doing well at this task is all about abstraction and composition. Um, in the same way that plans are compositional, programs are compositional. If I have, you know, a family of related tasks, uh, a family of related program synthesis tasks, I expect pieces of programs to get used over and over again across different instances of program synthesis problems that I'm presented with. Um, and in particular, if I can sort of identify and name reusable pieces of programs, then the space of programs that I have to reason about when I'm trying to generate you know, a specific one that produces some specific behavior um, will become a lot smaller than if I have to reason about you know, sort of like keywords and, and integer literals and things like that. And the state of the field of inductive program synthesis right now is actually quite similar to hierarchical policy learning. Um, there are things that work super well if you start by carefully designing a domain specific language for the domain of interest, like inverse graphics. Uh, there are things that sort of work okay in a fully super, uh, unsupervised way, even if you start from a really, really low level language, like, like 
pure lambda calculus or something. Um, but what we don't have right now are good procedures for automatically discovering reusable functions like the functions that we've called F1 and F2 on this slide uh, that align with the kinds of abstractions that humans actually use for programming. Um, and the main sort of claim that we're going to make here uh, is that the basically as before, uh, the abstractions that we want to call human-like, uh, the abstractions that people use, are precisely those things that tend to get names in natural language. And so if we can get people to describe program synthesis problems in language, that's again going to give us a sort of lightweight, distant supervision uh, that'll reveal the compositional structure that we care about inferring in programs. Um, and in fact, we can tackle this program induction problem using a model that looks very similar to the one that we used for the previous task. Uh, you know, similar generative story as before, we imagine that our natural language annotations are going to give rise to reusable program fragments that are composed together via some set of unobserved alignments between language and, and, and program chunks. Uh, and that these composed programs, when executed, are going to produce observed outputs. Um, and, you know, maybe unlike before, now our job is to actually infer these latent programs. Uh, and, in, you know, in particular, in contrast to the previous setting we were looking at, uh, it's the programs that themselves that we're really trying to get out at the end of the day. Uh, and we're going to assume that even at training time now, we don't actually have access to any ground truth programs at all. Uh, this is the sort of defining feature of program synthesis problems uh, that we have only input output pairs and, you know, the programming language, but no example programs themselves. Um, and it means that we have one more latent variable to reason about here, uh, namely, the, the, the one that we care about inferring. OK, uh, all that being said, the basic story here is basically going to be the same. Uh, we're going to have some annotations in natural language. We're going to have some programs that we observe. We're going to have some alignments between programs and language. And we're going to have some programs, uh, both of which are latent. Uh, and we're going to have models for relating them to each other. Uh, and in this case, the model that we're going to try to learn uh, is a generative model uh, that sort of jointly produces programs and strings. Uh, so, you know, before we had a model that took high level goals and generated uh, instructions or took instructions and generated actions. Here we're going to learn a sort of joint generative model of strings and programs. Uh, and fixing a program, uh, we're going to assume that there's a deterministic executor that turns, you know, something like, like this Lambda XF that we have on the slide right now into a concrete low level program. So the only sort of model that we have to learn, uh, the only set of free parameters, are the ones that relate programs to strings. Um, and here, maybe more than in this previous section, the specific form of this program generative uh, generation model is going to be pretty important. Uh, in particular, it's going to be backed not just by you know, a sort of continuous sequence to sequence model like we had before, but actually by a discrete library of automated uh, of, of, of functions that we've discovered. Um, and so this generative model of programs that we imagine is going to build programs and strings jointly by taking functions from this library, uh, gluing the programs together, gluing the associated strings together, uh, and in that way, giving rise to a joint distribution over strings and programs. Um, and, you know, this is very high level. We'll go into a little bit more detail momentarily. Uh, before we do that, you know, I'll just note that the learning algorithm is going to look very similar. Uh, we're going to try to maximize the complete likelihood of our data uh, with respect to, uh, you know, the observed programs, the observed annotations, and the highest scoring programs and alignments that we can find. Uh, again, we're going to do it via coordinate descent. Uh, and, you know, the, the other two steps look basically like before. Uh, what's going to be different is this parameter update step. So we said before that this model was defined by a set of sort of primitive library functions that are going to get composed together. And so when we update the parameters of this model, we're going to think of updating uh, the library that defines this model. Um, and in particular, we're going to choose an update rule uh, that updates libraries by minimizing the description length of the library and the data together, the sort of number of bits that it takes to describe all of my program fragments, uh, all of my library functions, and all of my training examples expressed in terms of those library functions. 
Uh, we can give this a probabilistic interpretation. You know, there's a sort of standard correspondence between like minimum description length coding and uh, and probabilistic modeling. Uh, but I think it's actually easiest to think about what goes on in this step in a sort of purely compression uh, compression based framework. Uh, so let's show off what this learning algorithm actually looks like. Um, suppose I have the following three programs, and don't worry yet about where they came from, uh, labeled with these natural language descriptions. So some program that draws seven gons, some program that draws five gons, and some program that draws acute angles. This learning step, uh, when we're you know, sort of updating the, the generative model parameters in our program synthesis uh, problem, uh, is going to first notice that there's a repeated fragment in all of these programs. Um, and it show, or a, rather, a repeated fragment across multiple of these programs that shows up only in those programs that are annotated with the word gone. Um, and what it's going to do is extract from this data set of programs a new library function that pairs this program fragment uh, with the word gone, and then is going to rewrite both of these uh, training examples, uh, both the sort of natural language annotations and the programs themselves, in terms of this new function. And as a result, what we've done now is shrunk the sort of joint size of the data set and the library. I only have to store one copy of this gone function and only one copy of the word gone. Uh, and then I can use that to sort of shrink the description of multiple training programs. Um, and so what I've done here is effectively used language to help me discover and abstract out a reusable program fragment that draws polygons. And so now when we do the parameter update step, we're going to sort of look for refactorings uh, of our programs and look for updates for our library uh, that you know, improve on a, a description length objective that looks like this, uh, maybe rather than a likelihood objective like in the previous section. Um, and this is going to be important because once we've discovered these library functions, we can actually use them during the program search phase. So, you know, the other thing that we're going to do differently in this learning algorithm right now is that we actually have to guess these latent variables uh, corresponding to computer programs. Um, and the goal of this search phase is to guess programs or to find programs, I guess, more generically that execute to the right values. Um, this is a, you know, a sort of binary success criteria. In some sense, there's nothing that you can do, but just like enumerate a bunch of programs, execute them, and then judge whether they actually produce the values that you're looking for. But if you enumerate them in the right order, or if you enumerate them with, you know, the sort of right, right set of high level program primitives, um, you're more likely to find something good. Um, and so here in particular, we're going to preferentially generate programs that use these functions that we added uh, to our library before. And this is going to let us find more complex programs, right? Find programs that contain other polygons uh, that would be very difficult to discover via sort of brute force search. Um, so in practice, what learning looks like is this. We start with a bunch of, uh, you know, outputs in a graphics domain, like just images that we're trying to draw and their associated natural language annotations. We'll search first, just like in you know, the space of raw Lambda calculus programs or raw Python programs or whatever. Uh, we'll probably fail on most of these search problems. We'll time out or something. But maybe on very, very simple problems like drawing a small triangle, uh, we find a program that actually executes successfully. And having found that, and having maybe found a couple of programs like that, we'll compress them using the procedure that we saw before, add the functions that we used for compression to our library, um, and then rinse and repeat. We've made our search problem easier. Uh, we can now search for other functions using this F4 function. We'll find more program fragments. Uh, we'll use these to induce more functions and so on. Um, two things that I want to call out here. Uh, first, the sort of machinery of this compression procedure is not something that we came up with. Uh, we're inheriting uh, a compression procedure from, from Kevin Ellis, who's now at Cornell. Um, and what's new algorithmically here uh, is that we're using language to actually drive this compression process. Uh, and what we're going to show is that you get much better compression and much better sort of uh, reusability of program fragments if you're guided by language than if you have to do things uh, in a sort of unconditional way. Um, second, uh, there's like a ton of other cool stuff that goes on the hood under the hood that I'm not going to be able to talk about today. Uh, th this program can actually like refactor up to uh, alpha and beta reductions. Uh, 
programs in a way that make them more compressible. Uh, there's some like linguistically informed priors here that let you do things, you know, sort of encode a preference toward like mutual exclusivity and word meanings. Uh, we're using language to guide the search heuristic and the search phase itself. Um, so lots more, I encourage you to read the paper if you're interested. But at the end of the day, this is sort of the skeleton of the procedure. Um, conscious that we're running low on time, so I'll try to wrap up here. Um, we've evaluated this on a couple of different data sets. I'm just going to show you these inverse graphics problems right now. Um, but, you know, so these are these are what these problems look like. These are what the natural language annotations for them look like. Uh, and these are the kinds of library functions that we learn. Um, so, you know, for example, for drawing a small semicircle, we infer some program that has this form, you know, function 19, function 9. Uh, for a medium semicircle, we call function 3 and then function 9. And the important thing to notice here is it seems like function 9 is generically a semicircle drawer. And similarly, we have our, you know, n-gon drawer uh, that we've, we've learned from scratch. Uh, and we have, you know, things that do even these, like, more complicated sort of pinwheel or snowflake shapes. Um, and what we're looking at at the bottom is just, like, across random restarts of this algorithm, what fraction of these program uh, inverse graphics problems are you able to solve? Uh, I think this is a function of wall time, but it could be the number of uh, calls to the evaluator. And, you know, the important thing here is that relative to the, like, best previous state-of-the-art uh, program synthesis engine, we can do substantially better just with a, like, tiny amount of natural language supervision. Um, and, you know, here's a sort of cool visualization of uh, what we learn and, you know, the sort of sequence of library functions that, that get inferred by this procedure and how they relate to each other. Cool. Um, so what we've done in this section is extended our approach uh, or extended the approach that we introduced in the policy learning context uh, to do program learning as well. And we showed that we could look hook up a sort of similar procedure, right, that sort of found correspondences between chunks of natural language and chunks of programs, hook that up to a state-of-the-art program synthesis algorithm, uh, and on you know, relatively small data sets of programs, use language to solve a bunch of really hard uh, program induction problems. Um, good. I will actually wrap up there. I have a bunch of stuff to say about natural language explanations, but there's definitely not time, uh, and I'm happy to talk about that later or answer questions if people have questions about that. Yeah, so, so thanks for the talk. Uh, I guess we have a few minutes for questions. Um, I think Nick had a question in the comments if you just want to ask it yourself. Yeah, um, I know this is probably more uh, on the, the compressibility of the library that you learn of these functions. But I'm just curious, um, you know, with very large, you know, code bases, you have to deal with sort of the generality of the programs and the type sensitivity and those kinds of issues. Um, I'm just wondering, sort of, uh, how do you sort of shape or control the library of learned functions? Um, and is there sort of like um, any sort of evaluative metrics that you guys discuss in this sort of field um, that would sort of get at the heart of like how, you know, long term, um, you know, library, fun a fun a library of functions could really be curated over time? Yeah. Um that's a great question. So the two things that shape uh, the set of functions that we learn right now are one, uh, just how much they compress the set of programs that you've already solved. So given, you know, sort of a data set of examples uh, where I have access to a program um, that generates that example or that passes the test or whatever, um, how much smaller can I make that program if I refactor it to use a new library function? Uh, so that's thing one. And then thing two is that notion of what it means for a program to be small uh, actually incorporates both the sort of code of the program and the natural language description of the program. So the other thing that drives it is uh, the extent to which you can find program abstractions that align to natural language strings. And so actually, you know, sort of looking at this example again, uh, one thing that's going on here, right, it's also the case that there's a this like rotate 72 shows up as a substring of both of these two programs, but there's no natural language string that this substring consistently corresponds to. Uh, and therefore, this procedure is going to prefer to compress out um, the gone function than 
this rotate 72 because we can't find, we can't pair it with natural language and we can't use it to shrink the strings. Um, there are all kinds of other criteria you could imagine using uh, to judge the sort of quality or the naturalness of a learned library. Um, you know, the student meeting I was having, like literally right before this, uh, we're thinking about how you might learn from sort of big code bases of natural code, what natural looking re sort of refactorings look like, or even just what natural looking or good looking um, library functions look like. And, you know, I think you could certainly imagine a much, much more sophisticated model, um, both just like, of the prior over programs and of the prior over libraries and of the correspondence between libraries and strings. Uh, and here we're doing that, you know, with relatively primitive, primitive tools. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. I think David Dohan has a question. Yeah, if you want to go ahead. Hey, um, great talk. Thank you for uh, taking the time to present. I was wondering if you have ideas for how to apply the 